We're continuing in our Jesus and Genesis series. We took a couple weeks off from our series as our children leave to Children's Church at this time. I wanted to say special thanks to Michael Burgard two weeks ago and Brian Ball last week for filling in and for preaching the last two weeks. But we find ourselves back in Genesis. Genesis chapter 9 is where we will be, verses 1 through 17. Before we read the text today, a question for you. What do you do when you're in a storm of life? Some of you are, pray is good, some of you are in a storm today. Some of you have just come out of a storm. If it's sunny, uh, this too shall pass. If it's cloudy, this too shall pass. Not in the time frame that we would like. Be patient. What do you do when you're in a storm and all you see is darkness and clouds? What do you do? In Genesis chapter 9. Remind, remind us as a church where we were. The flood happened. Noah and his family, his three sons and their wives, Noah's wife, the eight of them, experienced grace and salvation through the ark. And it rained. I know the question often asked in children's churches, how long did it rain? 40 days and 40 nights. No. It did rain 40 days and 40 nights. Then it rained another 150 days, 110 to 150 days of light rain. They were on the ark a total of just about a year. Some of you have experienced a storm that long or longer. Last week, we heard a message on transitions. And the reality is a lot of life is lived in transitions when you think about it. We're not where we were, and we're not where we want to be. We're somewhere in between. We're in that land between floating on an ark, wondering what's next. Genesis chapter 9. After the ark comes to rest, God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. In verse 2, The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground and on all the fish of the sea. Does this sound familiar at all? Remember, Genesis 1 through 11 covers as much time as Genesis 12 through the end of Revelation. A lot of time and many, many years are covered in the first 11 chapters of Genesis. If we understand early Genesis, it gives us a foundation to understand the rest of the Bible. This is God coming out with a director cut and saying, take two. You have the picture? Take two. First point today, if you're taking notes, this isn't in your notes, but it's a bonus. God's the God of second chances. God's the God of other opportunities. In your life, whatever has happened that you didn't plan to happen, mistakes, sin choices that you've made, regrets that have been made in your life, I'm here to tell you today, God can redeem that. God is the God of second chances, and you see that here in Genesis. Already in Genesis chapter 9, take 2. I'm going to give you another opportunity. I'm going to give you humankind, mankind, another opportunity. Be fruitful and multiply. It's the same thing he said to Adam and Eve. I'm going to do this again. And he talks about our relationship with creation. He goes in some more instruction in verse 4, but you shall not eat flesh with his life that is in the blood. And for your lifeblood I will require a reckoning. From every beast I will require it, and from man, from his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Verse 6, whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. The foundation of Genesis, again, we're reminded of the importance and the value of human life. Every man, woman, and child 
is made in the likeness and the image of God. Not just those who agree with us. Not just those who believe the exact same things that you and I believe. From the very first breath of a child, that value of life to the individual on their deathbed with just a few moments left. The value of life is just the same. Regardless of the nation of origin, regardless of where you're from, what you look like, what you've done, or what's been done to you, the value of human life is the same. In fact, you've never met a person who God does not love. Every interaction, every conversation you had with a person this week, God gave his son to die for them. That's how much he loves people. That becomes really, really clear. As we read through the rest of this text, there's going to be three relationships that stand out. Three relationships that God speaks for us to have. The first relationship is a relationship that you and I have with creation. There's some instruction how we're to manage and how we're to interact with creation. The second one is going to be how we relate to other people. How should we relate to other people? And the third point today is our relationship with God. How are we to relate with our Heavenly Father, with God? Three points covered in this, in this passage. Again, in verse 7, I'll read the rest of the text here. And you, be fruitful and multiply. Increase greatly on the earth and multiply in it. And then God said to Noah and his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant. If you highlight your Bible or you take notes, you could circle the word covenant. Eight times it's going to show up in verses 9 through 17. The word covenant. The Bible you want to understand God, you got to understand his promises. God's a God of covenants. I establish a covenant with you and your offspring after you, and with every living creature, the offspring after you is you and I. The covenant God makes here is just as relevant for you and I as it is to Noah. With every living creature that is with you, the birds, livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark, it is for every beast of the earth. If you have a pet, this covenant was made to your pet as well. Your pet is included in this promise. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you. For all future generations, again, you and I are included in that. I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth, storms, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember that everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all the flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. The relationship between creation, the relationship we have with our fellow man, and the relationship that we have with God, all clearly presented here in the first few verses. The word covenant mentioned eight times in just about as many verses. What is a covenant? There are conditional covenants in the Bible, and there are unconditional covenants in the Bible. This falls in the realm of an unconditional covenant. There are the top five covenants, five covenants in the Bible. This is the first one. Some would say the Adamic covenant, the covenant, the promise given to Adam, that's, that's found in Genesis 3. But I'm, I'm going to look at five covenants. This is the first you have the Abra no way at covenant. That's the promise that God's making. A couple facts about the covenant, unconditional covenant. Who initiates it? It's not you and it's not me. God initiates the covenant. God initiates the promise. A covenant is made between two living beings. Now, the word in Latin is testam testament. It's where we get the word testament. Most of your Bibles, if you have a Bible sitting there on your lap, you have probably says it there on the cover of your Bible, right? You have the, the Old Testament, 
Testament, the New Testament. Now, in English, that word testament, we use it between two parties. If you, if you think of the word last, living will and testament. The word testament, we often use between two parties, but one party has what? Deceased. Testament. But covenant is between two living parties. An unconditional covenant is God initiated it. This is the I will and I shalls of God that are just as relevant in your life today as they were for Noah thousands and thousands of years ago. You didn't initiate this covenant. God initiates it. You and I receive it. You and I are the, the recipients of the covenant. You and I receive all the blessings without doing any of the work. God gives the covenant to Noah, the first. And then you have the Abrahamic covenant. Let me just walk through the five. You have the Abrahamic covenant. You have the Mosaic or Le Levitical covenant, which is the law. And then you have the Davidic covenant, the promise to David that the line, the Messiah is going to come through your line. And then finally, at the end of service today, we'll recognize through the symbol of the new covenant, the new covenant, which if you're in Jesus, you're a part of the new covenant. And if you're not in Jesus, there's an invitation for you today to be part of that new covenant. And we'll recognize that through the Lord's Supper. And God's a God of symbols and signs and encouraging us to remember his work and his grace. And he does that by speaking uh, to Noah about the sign that we'll look at. The first relationship is with, is with creation. A couple things we see here. There's the idea that we are to rule over the earth. We are to maintain and manage the earth. There's a certain ecology that is biblical. And we're not talking about being tree huggers. We're not talking about valuing creation over human life. But there is a certain mandate given to us to treat creation well. Whether that's gardening in your backyard. Some of you were doing that this week. You have to get out really, really early to do that. If you have a pet, so if you have an animal in your house, it's not kicking the dog when you're mad. It's managing that, treating animals with dignity. And Let me tell you something about animals. Creation and animals are impacted by the fall, but not infected by sin like you and I are. You and I are in, infected with sin. It's passed on. Every baby before that baby breathes its first life, it's a sinner. All right? It's a cute baby, but it's, it's a sinner. Creation is not. In fact, I'd say the trees outside are fulfilling their purpose and glorifying God more than you and I are, naturally. Uh, the dogs in the neighborhood are not conspiring at night to do evil tomorrow. Mankind is. Mankind is, never stops searching to do evil and coming up with ways to steal, kill, and destroy. Elizabeth Elliot says that the clam is fulfilling his purpose more than you and I are. And all of creation, the rocks and the trees, as you engage with creation, they're on their tippy toes waiting for God to bring redemption to this earth. They're impacted by sin and the brokenness of the world. You and I are infected with it. And so the next time you get angry at your dog, just, just remember, or whatever pet you have, they're fulfilling their purpose more than you and I often are, giving glory to God. All of creation, the Psalms tell us, all of creation waits to burst forth in worship. The rocks cry out and the trees will clap their hands in worship. Our relationship with with creation. Now, some would take this text to say the only meat that we should eat is well done meat. Any well done fans in the room? How do you like your meat? Some would look at this text and say, uh, no 
blood is to be in the meat that you eat. Now, let's just stop and say, thank you, Jesus, that we get to eat meat. Prior to this, yeah, there's a couple of claps. <laughs> Prior to this, they were only vegetarians. They were not eating meat. Part of the blessing, right? Part of the covenant, the Noahic covenant, is that we can have steak today. It's a good thing, right? So that's part of the, again, we don't do any of the work. We just receive all the blessings. All right, so what does it mean? The lifeblood. You shall not eat flesh with its life, that is its blood. Bottom line, value the life of creation. Animals. How aren't you grateful that God didn't, didn't, didn't leave us just with each other? He gave us a pet, no matter the day that you had, good, bad, how you were treated, the mistakes you made, you open that front door. And if you're a dog owner, you know what I'm talking about. A dog has no idea the type of day you had. Comes up and licks you. And it's your best friend. I'm grateful that God gave us animals to enjoy, and we are to steward that responsibility well, to treat animals well. Then you head into the relationship that we have with other people, relationship with creation, relationship with people. Uh, Genesis 9, 6, this passage, this verse has been used by many against capital punishment and for capital punishment. At best case, it could be used to support capital punishment. But when you read it in the text, it's not talking about government. It's not talking about authority. The text is talking about the value of human life. And this is not, God's not giving us that responsibility. He's saying, I see when one person assaults another person. When there is an act of violence from one person to another person, God is saying, I see that. And I notice that. And God will provide justice in that situation. Whoever sheds the blood of man by man shall his blood be shed. I trust God in that. Now, are you for capital punishment or against capital punishment? I, I would say uh, lean on the side where the Holy Spirit leads you in this area. It is not a mandate. Capital punishment is not a mandate. In the, we live in the day of grace. Now, forgiveness does not always mean the lack of consequences. There can be consequences that a person has to face, according to government. It doesn't mean that they cannot be forgiven and redeemed. It's an interesting text. And God is making the point that all of human life, all of human life has equal worth and value. You cannot put a, a price. You cannot put value. The person sitting in a prison cell today who's done horrendous things has infinite worth and value. I don't know how you feel when you think about that. A person has infinite worth and value in the eyes of God. Every person, regardless where they're born, their race, their nationality, what they believe, God loves them. They have infinite worth and value. And we are to treat them as such. I think there's a sense of justice from mankind to mankind in this text. Why do we do a food drive once a month? Because we are to care for our brothers and our sisters who are in need in our community. Why do we give to foreign missions on foreign lands? Because God loves people growing up in places where there are not churches established on every corner like we have in the States. And so we give our money. We're to be promiscuous with our money. The early Christians were called by the, by the Romans as the church was getting started. The Romans were promiscuous with their bodies, but they held on to their money. But they said, but these Christians, they're the exact opposite. They're generous and promiscuous with their money and discerning with their bodies. How are you described? Are you described as someone who's generous, who meets the needs of your fellow mankind when they are in need? Covenant relationship. Over and over and over again in this text, God talks about his 
He takes the initiative. And finally, our relationship with God. This is, this is important. Our relationship and your relationship with God. I began the, the message asking you a question about storms. You're going through something difficult in your life, something really, really hard. And some of you have been there for a long time. And you're waiting for the sun to start peering through the storm clouds. It's really interesting in this text. It says, when I provide the clouds, who provides the storms in our life? It's God. God provides the storms. And you're wondering, how long is the storm going to last? What do you do when you find yourself in the middle of a crisis, in the middle of a storm? You trust God and his promises. You trust God and his covenant relationship. Really interesting as I look at this first covenant made to Noah. Rain, and we talk about the rainbow here in this text. The rainbow has been a sign of God's promises for thousands and thousands of years. And it will continue to be. I'm not worried that the rainbow is going to be hijacked. For when you and I look at the rainbow, we're to be reminded of the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel is good news for all people, for all time. You only have rainbows when there's a storm. You cannot have a rainbow without a storm. You have rainbows after the storm. In order to get to the picture of the rainbow, you, might, you know what you must go through? The storm. And some of you are holding out hope for the rainbow today. You're in the middle of a crisis. You're in the middle of a storm. And just on the other side of that storm is a rainbow. And what does the rainbow represent? The rainbow represents, actually in Hebrew, the word is called warbow. And God is saying, never again will I pick up my bow and shoot it toward earth. When you look at a rainbow, if you think of the picture and the image of a rainbow, it's shooting where? It's shooting up. And Charles Spurgeon says that rainbow is shooting up at something else or someone else. For God did not dissolve his wrath. God did not lay aside his wrath, but his wrath went in a different direction. The wrath of God and the judgment of God no longer comes toward you and comes toward me. The wrath of God, because of your sin and because of my sin, went in a different direction. In Isaiah 53, it says that Jesus was pierced for our transgressions. Jesus took the wrath that you and I deserve. And the war bow, when you see it in the sky, it should be a picture of grace, a reminder of grace. A reminder that God took the lightning so that you and I might have grace. God took the wrath so you, might, you and I might have grace. And may I propose to you, regardless of how difficult your storm is today, it is not as bad as it could be. I know it's bad. I know it's difficult. I know what you're going through is hard. It is not as bad as it could be. For without God's grace, we're all doomed to eternity without, without him. The rainbow is the gospel. A few, a few things about the rainbow. The rainbow is the backdrop of God's grace. You'll never find a rainbow on a sunny day. Often we don't find God's grace unless something has gotten to see our flaws and our sin. Number two, it's the sweeping promise of God's grace. On earth, all you see is the bow. We get the rainbow. God gets the lightning. It's an astonishing secret of God's grace. As I mentioned, if you and I had the symbol after a storm of that rainbow upside down, we all would get nervous. It'd make me nervous. But it's not pointed at us anymore. It's pointed at him. God is aiming his arrow somewhere else at someone else. It's the conjunction of the sun 
and the storm. The arrows went, as Isaiah 53 says. He got the arrows. On the cross of Jesus, we see the storm. We see the love of God. And again, God got the lightning. So we get the rainbow. In the middle of your storm today, what are you not trusting God for? It's been only one person in your life, one relationship in your life that has never let you down, that has always kept his promise. Think about all the relationships in your life, your parents, employers, your children, your spouse, To some extent, they've broken their promise. I broke my wedding vows probably the next day. You you ever think about wedding vows, the things that we say? Holy cow, the standard is way up here. And sickness and health, they're great words. Humanly speaking, we cannot fulfill those vows. Humanly speaking, we cannot keep unconditional covenants like God can. There is only one person who you can trust fully and completely who will never let you down, who will keep his word, every promise in scripture. And just for fun, let me tell you how many promises in scripture there are. 8,810 promises. 7,487 of them are promises made by God to you and I. And he has kept... Of those 7,487 of them, he has kept 7,487 of them. You can trust God. What is it right now in your life that you are not trusting God with? That he has said, that he has taken the initiative, that he has paid the the, the cost. He has made the down payment on. Unconditional. It's not dependent on you or me. Isn't that good news? God keeps his promises regardless of how I act. Do you have another relationship in your life like that? God is true to his word. He keeps his promises. You can take him to the bank. He will never lie to you. He is faithful and he is just. There's a song that was written, I believe, in 1860 called Standing on the Promises. It was written by a young man. He was a teacher. And he was given a life, a death sentence, basically, because he had heart failure at the age of 25. And he prayed for God to save him. But he said, even if he doesn't, I'm going to stand on the promises of God. You've probably heard this before. If it's not good in your life, God is not done. If you can't say confidently today that things are good, then God is not done working in your life. In fact, while you slept last night in anticipation to come to service, God was at work doing 10,000 things behind the scene on your behalf. Why? Because God keeps his promises. When we look at the covenant to Noah, God initiated it. He says, it is my covenant. And he also says, it is eternal. It has no end date. God's promises to you and I do not expire. The storm that you're going through, it is not because you've done something wrong. Right? Now, we all make choices, and we have to live with the consequences of the choices. But God is not up in heaven, looking down on you, causing it to rain on your life and make your life miserable because of his wrath and his judgment. His wrath and his judgment does not fall on you. It felt on Jesus. And so if you have that thought in your mind that bad things are happening to you because God is out to get you, I want you to leave that here today. I do not want you to leave this room today with guilt and shame over the choices that you've made in your your life. But lay them down at the cross And be reminded of the promises, the eternal promises that God has for you. Standing on the promises. 
standing on the promises that cannot fail. This is what the young man wrote back in the 1800s. When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail. I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword, standing on the promises of God. Are you standing on the promises today? Or are you standing on your thoughts, the opinions of the world, instruction from other people? Are you standing on the truth of God? A couple of passages I want to share with you. First is in Isaiah 54, 8 and 9. Isaiah, a prophet who comes many years after the time of Noah. But with everlasting kindness, I want, I want you to hear these words as God's speaking to you today. God speaking to you with everlasting kindness, I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. To me, this is like the days of Noah, when I swore that the waters of Noah would never again cover the earth. Listen to this. So now I have sworn not to be angry with you. My friends, God is not angry with you. All his anger went into his son, Jesus, on your behalf. God is not angry with you. We also get the picture that unconditional covenants, each and every one of them is an eternal covenant. I don't know if you know this, but in heaven, we're going, as we enter the throne room, I don't know if you know what's above the throne. In Revelation chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, let me read this for you. And immediately, John writes, I was in the Spirit. And behold, a throne was set in heaven. Sometimes in prayer, when you close your eyes, you get an image of, I don't know what image you get. A throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like jasper and a sardine stone. And do you know what was around the throne? And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. The throne of God is surrounded with this great sign, this great promise. It's the gospel in the sky. And the storm that you're currently going through or the next storm that you face. I want you to know there's a rainbow that waits you as a symbol and a sign of God's grace. What are you not trusting in God for today? What has he told you that you've not fully trusted in him on? What area of your life are you still holding on to? Listen, he has a pretty good track record. An unconditional promise. The first of five throughout Scripture. The Noahic covenant. A promise. Not based on the goodness of Noah. It doesn't take him very long before he falls into complete and utter depravity. This man who's in the hall of fame of faith, we're going to see in a couple of weeks what happens with Noah. But it's good news that God's blessings and God's promises and God's grace and our relationship with Jesus is not based on our behavior. It's based on what Jesus has done for you. You can take that to the bank. I'm going to pray. In just a few moments, we're going to remember another symbol and another sign. God's full of them. It's the sign of communion, the Lord's Supper. As we enter this time, I want to ask you, this is an opportunity for you to be honest with God. And if there is unconfessed sin in your life, there is no judgment here today. There is freedom to let the place, the plate pass you by today. For Scripture tells us we need to deal with conflict with another person if that is preventing us from coming to the table today. It's an opportunity for us to reflect on our sin, to confess that to God. And then to remember, and to remember that Jesus was pierced 
for our transgressions, for your sin and for my sin. We did not pay for. Jesus paid for. This is for those who've given their life to Jesus. If you've not given your life to Jesus, you can do that right now. You can participate in this family meal with us by simply confessing your sin, recognizing that he took your sin, defeated death, and now is seated at the right throne, right hand of God where there's a rainbow over his throne. Would you join me in prayer? Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for this passage of Scripture that reminds us of the rainbow that we see in the sky. That this storm that we're in will end. And if we're not in a storm, there's a storm coming. I pray, God, that we would, you would give us the ability to trust you to confidently move forward in what you're asking us to do. It's what faith is, trusting without seeing. As we come to the table, I pray, God, that you would hear our confession to you. We thank you for the work of Jesus and what he did on the cross. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'm so glad that you joined us for today's service. Let me leave you with a few next steps that you can take. Number one, let us know that you're participating online. You can make a comment there in the notes. You can send me an email or you can give the church a call. Just let us know. We'd love to add you to our email list that updates our people on what is happening in the life of the church. Number two, if there's something I can specifically be praying for you about, I can give that prayer request. I will pray for you, but I can also give that to our prayer team. A third next step that you can take, if you've been encouraged by the ministry of Boulder Mountain, even though you've maybe never been here physically, uh, let me encourage you to give. We believe that giving teaches us contentment. When we recognize that God's been generous to us, so at Boulder Mountain, we give first, we save second, then we live on the rest. So there's an opportunity for you to participate in giving through our church website. If there's anything else that I can be doing for you or, or Boulder Mountain can do for you by sending you resources, simply let us know. Otherwise, let me pray for you as we close our service. And so for those, Father, who are not here in the room, we recognize church is not a building we come and sit in. So wherever they are at, we know and we believe that, Jesus, you are with them. So I pray that they would sense your presence and your power. Holy Spirit, give them the wisdom to know what to do, and then give them the courage to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you this week.